Welcome to Book by Book. Tonight, we're going to uh, cover Isaiah chapters 5 through 7. I had originally hoped to get through some of chapter 8, but there's just so much. There's so much. We're going to be in Isaiah for a while. I just, I don't want to rush it, but I also want to handle the text uh, well and make sure that we are <coughs> wrestling with things. Um, because to tonight, one of the challenges is uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 14, when it starts talking about uh, the son that will be born. You shall call him Emmanuel, God with us. And wrestling with the reality that this, is, this had a significance for the people that Isaiah was talking to immediately. But then also, as followers of Jesus today, we look back and we see that as a heavily messianic text we look at that as that's Jesus. And so trying to unpack those, uh, those ideas. But then also we have um, Isaiah and his call account where he uh, saw the Lord in, uh, in the throne room of heaven. Uh, and so there is a lot of stuff that's happening in this passage. Um, and so as we are jumping in, um, the... Different uh, commentators break up the book into di like different sections, um, but when we really get to chapter 7 through 39, the theme that we're going to read over and over again is learning to trust the Lord. Learning to trust the Lord. And so, um, so today, as we jump in, remember the, the message to uh, Ahaz was uh, essentially like punishment is coming, discipline is coming. But there will be a, um, a stump that a branch will grow out of, right? And that in this situation, that branch growing out of the stump, it really is the, um, the people, the remnant of the people of Israel that will grow and uh, enjoy the, the fruit of the land. And so, um, so that's going to be part of what uh, we're responding to from chapter 4. Moving into chapter 5, because we get another kind of a, a judgment oracle um, from Isaiah, from the Lord, through Isaiah. Um, because as we are looking at this, the Lord is saying, like, I basically set you up for success. And now you're falling apart to the people of Israel. Um, so a bit of a paraphrase there. But uh, let's, uh, yeah, so let's jump in. Chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> uh, okay, yeah. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. So this is Isaiah singing about the one he loves is the Lord. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for, my, for good grapes, why did it only yield bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do with, to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I, sorry, I need to check something real quick. All right, yeah, that's working. Um, sorry. Uh, I will check uh, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice but saw bloodshed, for righteousness but heard cries of distress. And so, yeah, so here the, the oracle starts with Isaiah saying, look at what the one I love has made. The, the Lord has made this vineyard. And then in chapter or verse three, that it switches to now the Lord speaking directly to the people and, and asking, what more could I have done? Like I form, I, I broke up the earth. I planted the vineyard. I cultivated, I built a wall around you. And I went looking for good fruit and found only the bad fruit. And, and so every, the fruit here now is, 
I mean, is not really concerned with actual grapes, right? He's talking about the fruit of their lives and how they uh, rebelled against him, the Lord, and moved towards the nations, which produced injustice, which produced violence and bloodshed, which produced idolatry. All of these things are the, the bad fruit that the Lord saw. And so he starts to say, like, the, the wall will be destroyed. And then, now the wall and the hedge, it's interesting how in the ancient world, like, they would create, like, a vineyard area. They would care for, um, like, a, a plot of land. And to protect that land, they would actually plant really uh, thick thorn bushes around it so that like, animals wouldn't come in and eat the crops. So thinking about the, uh, the parable of the soils, and Jesus says there's these four different types of soils. There's the path, there's the stony uh, soil, there's the thorny soil. Those thorns are, and then there's the good soil, of course. Uh, but those thorns, that's the, the protection, like, around the good area. Um, and so, like, when, when he's saying that parable, all the people would have known, like, oh, yeah, of course, this is how you prepare land. So, um, and so th- instead of building a brick wall around all of your, uh, your garden, you'd plant some thorns. The problem with thorns, though... As we all know, if you have any experience with gardening and uh, landscaping in our region, thorns grow everywhere, and it's hard to maintain them. Uh, and and so my neighbor Joe had like a completely overgrown backyard, and he spent all of last summer hacking away blackberry bushes, and he ran each branch through a tiny little wood chipper. And I don't understand why he did that. Um, but all day, one branch at a time. And it was, it was a good summer at the Duman house. Um, but it, like those, if you don't keep the thorns and the, the, the blackberries where you want them to be, they're going to, they're going to increase and grow and grow and grow. And so here the Lord is saying like, look, I built a protective hedge to keep predators out, but even that's not going to do be enough to keep the predators out. And I, I'll build a wall, but it's still going to be trampled and become a wasteland. And the trampling is the like the flocks and the uh, the herds, I should say, uh, that would just walk wherever they want and graze on whatever they want. And so that's the that's what the Lord is saying is coming to uh, to Israel and Judah. And so at this time, Israel is still holding on in the north. They haven't yet fallen, but the Lord is saying, like, it's coming. This, this discipline is coming to the people. Um, and so he's, he's emphasizing, Isaiah is emphasizing the Lord's commitment to the people, the effort that he put into maintaining relationship with them and providing for them, and their neglect of his vineyard. Um, and so it produced bad fruit. Uh, so... Uh, Verse 8. <clears throat> Woe to you who add, who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left, and you live alone in the land. The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, Surely the great houses will become desolate, the fine mansions left without occupants. A ten-acre vineyard will produce only a bath of wine. A homer of seed will only yield an ephah of grain. <clears throat> Woe to you, woe to those who raise early, rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. They will have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and timbrels and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger and the common people will be parched with thirst. Therefore, death expands its jaws, opening wide its mouth. Into it will descend their nobles and their masses, with all their brawlers and revelers. So people will be brought low, and everyone humbled, the eyes of the arrogant humbled. But the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice, and the holy God will be proved holy by his righteous acts. Ten sheep will graze as their own pasture, in their, as in their own pasture. Lambs will feed among the ruins of the rich. 
Woe to those who draw, sign, uh, who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. To those who say, let God hurry, let him hasten his work so we may see it. The plan, the Holy One of Israel, let it approach, let it come into view so we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, and who, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are wise, uh, woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit the guilty for a bribe, but deny justice to the innocent. So in this section, we have um, six woes, which are warnings. Uh, so you can read woe as a lookout warning. You can also read it as like a, um, like a lament, like, oh, for these people. Um, and so here, these different categories of woe, uh, they, they are looking at uh, neglect of the law of God, the, uh, forgetting the covenant, but also uh, taking advantage of the vulnerable the quartet of the vulnerable that we will see over and over again in the prophets, the widow, the orphan, the poor, and the foreigner among us. That is the quartet of the vulnerable that the people of Israel were supposed to have a special care for. Um, and so the first one here, uh, the first woe is looking at those who add house to house. So essentially, they are building their estates and taking from the poor. And as we remember in the law, the land was apportioned to families, and it was supposed to stay in the family. And every seven years, there was the forgiveness of debt, and, and every 50th year in the year of Jubilee, there was the restoration of land and a complete basic economic reset for the people of Israel. We have no indication that they ever actually did it. Um, and so here we have... Uh, the, the message to, the, to those who are just gobbling up land. So it's not necessarily that their houses are too close, like they're not living up to code. Um, it's, it's, it's you are taking this house and this house and making it yours and not restoring that uh, when it is time to restore. And so this, you think you're going to build a big property in a 10-acre vineyard, but you're not going to be able to produce the amount that 10 acres should produce is what the warning for those rich landowners is. The second one is those who, uh, who party, basically, who give themselves over to drunkenness uh, and the warning that they are, you know, they're, they're running after drinks all morning and all night and they party and all this stuff. They think they're having a great time, um, but they are not caring for uh, the Lord, for his deeds, for his work, um, and they think they just deserve everything. And um, because of their, their entitlement. And it says here that uh, for those folks that death expands its jaws. And death here is, is Sheol, uh, which is the, the realm of the dead in, uh, in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures. We don't have necessarily a strong picture of, of hell or heaven after death. Um, everybody dies and they go someplace in the Old Testament. Um, and so here it's just like the, the realm of the dead. Well, later in, in uh, the Gospels, we'll see Jesus will talk about going uh, in the parable of the, the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus and the rich man, they both die. And uh, the, Lazarus is taken to the realm of the dead, but he is in comfort in, with Abraham. And the rich man is in torment uh, and he can see across the, the chasm, right? And so Jesus gives us a picture of what Sheol looks like, um, in, potentially. Uh, but like when we think of death in the Old Testament, we probably should, we, I, I want to just be cautious to not just say, well, they died, they went to heaven or hell. Like, that's not the real picture that we get in the Hebrew Scriptures. Like Everybody dies, and they go to the realm of the dead. Later, um, there it develops over time that we get a picture of like, well, what then happens? What, what does God do after uh, that? And so, but that's a development. So here, 
we're not quite there yet <laughs> in understanding what's happening. Um, so there we, we have that that woe. So the, the, prou the proud and the arrogant, they will be brought low. Um, those who uh, draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. This imagery is of, of beasts of burden that are pulling a cart. And what's in the cart is, for these folks is just all their sin. And they're working real hard to bring their sin along. Um, and, and one of the reasons that the, this image is important is because um, it would just be so much easier if you just let the sin go, is what Isaiah is communicating. Like, the Lord wants you to let go of all that, but you are holding on to your sin. And that sin could be idolatry. It could be the drunkenness that they're talking about here. It could be um, the, the sexual immorality that is part of the idolatry. All these different things are just working so hard to hold on to their sin, uh, which will lead them to their destruction as well. And then uh, verse 20, uh, those who call evil good and good evil. And so just a reversal of God's standards. And th that, that's a warning to them that they are confused and they are celebrating. If they're calling evil good, they're celebrating evil, essentially. Um, and so the Lord is going to bring them uh, their own judgment as, uh, where they thought they were enlightened. They're actually going to be in darkness. Uh, and then woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight, people who think they know better than God. Um, that's never happened since Isaiah's time, right? Um, uh, and those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks. Like, Heroes and champions should be like the warriors, right? And the people who um, are fighting for the people. But these folks are boasting about how good they make their Manhattans or whatever. I don't, I don't drink, so I don't know what a cocktail is, really, what the names are. I just know Manhattan is a thing. <laughs> That's where I'm at. Um, but they did, they're champions at this. Um, and so, like, their major accomplishment is uh, their, their drunkenness. So all of these things are warnings that the Lord is giving to the people to say, you have your priorities all jacked up. They're all out of whack. And if you keep down this path, then judgment will come. And, and so this is where chapter, uh, verse 24 it starts looking at what that judgment will look like. Uh, Therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw and as dry grass sinks down in the flames, so their roots will decline decay and their flowers blow away like dust for they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel and so this is getting back to that vineyard imagery like the the fire is going to come through and burn up all of the the vineyard and so like the the flowers you know like springtime is coming right and that's when like things start to bloom um, and where you start to see the bloom on, on your produce is like, okay, we're going to have a good crop. And so it's like, you think things are going to go well, but here comes the fire, is what the Lord is saying. Uh, Therefore, the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. Yet for all his anger is not turned away, his hand is still upra upraised. He lifts up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. Here they come, swiftly and speedily. Not one of them grows tired or stumbles. Not one slumbers or sleeps. Not a belt is loosened at its waist. Not a sandal strap is broken. Their arrows are sharp. All their bows are strung. Their horses' hooves seem like flint. Their chariot wheels like a whirlwind. Their roar is like that of a lion. Their roar... They roar like young lions. They growl as they seize their prey and carry it off with no one to rescue. In that day, they will roar over it like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks at the land, there is only darkness and distress. Even the, the sun will be darkened by clouds. So, I mean, not good things coming. But the imagery that we... <laughs> Isaiah mixes a lot of metaphors in this section. So uh, we could spend a lot of time looking at all of the different metaphors, but 
one of the most important things as we walk through this, like it, Israel is, the northern kingdom is struggling um, and they're facing difficulty from uh, Syria, Assyria, so Aram and Assyria. Like there's these different nations that are kind of chipping away at the northern kingdom. They're getting weaker and weaker. Um, and the northern kingdom is like full on loving their, their rebellion and their sinfulness. And the Judah, the southern kingdom, is has moments of goodness and moments of uh, despair. And so they, they can see what's happening in the northern kingdom, and they can see Assyria mounting, right? And so what the Lord is saying in, in this section that is so important is like he whistles and the other kingdom starts coming. So even though Assyria and, and Aram are pagan countries, the Lord is still sovereign over them. They are his, his means in these passages to bring the discipline on his people. So there, the Lord is orchestrating all of these rises, rising and falling of empires, um, and he's using their strength to accomplish his purposes which is to purify the, the land from his own people's rebellion, which is awful. Like when we read it, it's like, why would, why, why, why? But what we have to remember, like we could read this and say, look how judge, judgmental the Lord is and like his wrath and his anger. But look back at the six woes just right before. The people have been terrible right? They've been rejecting his design for them, and he has been gracious up to now and has preserved them, and the time has come for the Lord to do a, a final work here. Um, and so as he is looking at the, the imagery, they come uh, like, a, like a whirlwind, essentially, like the... the the chariots uh, and the horses never tire and they're, they're loud and the, you hear it coming and the sound of them coming is like a roaring lion. But then it's also the sound of the roaring ocean. And I, I was just talking with some folks uh, at neighborhood table about going to the ocean. And I love the ocean. It's, it's so loud there. <laughs> like, it, like it's, especially like ocean shores, like windy and storm, storm tossed, and um, the that's the imagery that the Lord wants to communicate. Like it's going to be overwhelming, the the discipline that's coming against the Northern Kingdom at this time, and the Southern Kingdom should not feel like well that's their problem, because they've also got their own struggles as well, and so. Um, so then from there, we have a little pause in chapter 5. We, we get this picture of coming judgment. And so a lot of people kind of wrestle with the way that the chapters are organized in the book of Isaiah. Um, because it's like, why is Isaiah's commission not first? Why is it so far into the text? Um, and it could be that um, this is, like Isaiah had a commissioning or a calling event that we don't have recorded. Or it could be he gave this message, uh, th these oracles to the people, and they said, who do you think you are? And so then he said, well, let me tell you about when God called me. And so then he's re relaying this information to them. It could be. We don't for sure know. But we do know that this happened, and, because six one tells us uh, when it happened, in the, the year that King Uzziah died. And so Uzziah was a king who had a, led the nation into a period of prosperity, and they were doing well in, the, in Judah, in the southern kingdom. They were doing well. Things were um, great for the, the, the southern kingdom because the Assyrians were really only bothering the northern kingdom at this part, point. Uh, the king at the time there was uh, in the, from Assyria was Tiglath-Pileser III, um, and so he's making his attacks up north, and, and it's like, oh, we're, we're going to be all right. Um, and so for the first time since Solomon, Judah is actually expanding and growing, and uh, they're not facing the threats 
from their neighbors that they had been. Um, and, but this is a turning point because Uzziah's son, Ahaz, is not great. He's not a, he's not a great king. Um, and so, is it Ahaz? Jotham? Jotham and then Ahaz, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so, so there's a turning point that's happening in the, uh, in the kingdom that um, Isaiah is called into that that season. And so, uh, yeah, verse 1, let's look at some of this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See that this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. So this image of the Lord seated on his throne uh, is is overwhelming, and Isaiah ha- ex- expresses that. He's completely overwhelmed by what he's experiencing here. Um, but the, the, the picture that we should see as we think about the temple, the temple had in the Holy of Holies the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant had on top of it the, the cherubim, right, on the mercy seat. That was considered the footstool for God's throne, right? And so he is seeing, like, the beyond the immediate, like just the footstool. He's like seeing God's glory and getting a picture into the heavens, into God's actual throne room. And and so it's just amazing. And the the train of his robe fills the the temple here on earth. Like he's just like so overwhelmed by just the the presence of his clothes, right? Like that they're they're filling the temple uh, in, in, in Jerusalem. And around him are these seraphim that are flying, these six-winged creatures that are flying and worshiping the Lord. And this was like the coolest thing. Uh, The word for seraphs is also translated as serpent. And and so people try to figure out like, what what are these? (laughs) These flying serpent creatures? It's weird, right? Like, it's not just like babies with wings and diapers. It's, it's like these are powerful, overwhelming beings that you see worshiping the Lord. But let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. Is that serpent... Just some kind of lizard? Or is that serpent an angel? Is that serpent a seraph that is coming and talking to Adam and Eve? So some like we get like hung up, people are like, they're talking to a snake, right? And I can't like argue hundred percent certainty. Like, no, this was an angel, a six-winged angel that came and talked to them. But like the image of the serpent and the is also in an ancient tradition called a dragon. And so here, flying around God, the Lord, are these six-winged, fiery, serpent, angel, dragon beings. What? Like, you can imagine, like, Isaiah, like, encountering this and experiencing this, like, this would be completely overwhelming. Like, 
to see God's glory, even just his footstool and his, the train of his robe, and to hear his voice talking uh, and seeing all these, these mysterious creatures worshiping him and flying around, and it would be overwhelming for sure. And, and so he says, like, uh, woe is me, I am ruined. He has a recognition of his own sinfulness. And the angels, the seraphim, are singing and worshiping, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holiness is not just, wow, you're really nice, you know, like you're a good, good being. No, like holiness is pure. It's perfect. It is without fault. And, and so this triple declaration of God's holiness is a like emphasis on this is how good and awesome and wonderful he is. And Isaiah's response is, I am not that good. And he just confesses it. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips. And, and here we have this atonement where a seraph, a seraph comes and takes a coal and puts it on his mouth. And coal, the fire, like people have kind of wrestled with, like, where is this coal from? Is this a coal from the burning altar in the temple um, where the sacrifices were made? Maybe. But there is no, in this particular thing, there is no blood shed for Isaiah's sins. But the seraph comes and and purifies him with fire and cleanses his mouth, cleanses his lips. And then... um, the, and says his sins are atoned for, which like you are forgiven, you are made clean. And then the Lord asks, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Uh, and the for us is another one of those questions that we ask, who's us here? And there's all kinds of debate on as we read through the prophets, we want to make sure that we are honoring the time and the people that they are speaking to. And in the Old Testament, like we see us and Christians will we'll kind of quickly jump onto Trinity. It's the Trinity. Maybe. <laughs> it could be. But what is also the us here is there's these other beings that God is with. The seraphim, the cherubim. There's these angels, there's these creatures around the Lord, uh, these supernatural beings. And for, for some, like we could read this and say, this is like the heavenly council is the us here. Because we've looked at visions of uh, uh, the prophet that was sent to like uh, deceive the king in the, the northern kingdom. Like if we remember that scene, there was a, the Lord saying, who will go for us? And that us there was all these different angels. And one of the angels said, I'll go. I'll go lie to that king. And the, the worked through the prophet, and the prophet went to go and get the king to fall for a trick, basically. Right? So there's all these creatures. And then think again about, about Job. And Job is, the, it begins with a, a picture of God in the... Uh, in the heavenly council, and who comes to see the Lord? Hasatan, the accuser, comes, and the Lord says, where do you come from? And he says, I've come from to and fro, wandering the earth. And the Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? And that kicks off Job's trials. And so the Lord has these other folks that he will send. Uh, the folks, these beings that he will send. And so here, when the Lord says, who will go for us, the the Hebrew scripture understanding would be the heavenly council. Who will go and respond to to the Lord, bring the message of the Lord to the people. And there may have been other, there may have been angels there who would have said, oh, I'll go, I'll go. Because we've seen angels say, I'll go. But here, Isaiah says, here am I, send me. He's stepping in to a divine call without really having all the information. <laughs> like, 
it's a big deal that he is stepping in to say, I will go. When what we have seen in other in instances with this council uh, imagery is it's, it's angels who go. But Isaiah is saying, I will go. And um, so what does he commission him to do? And this is, so just so you know, I'm not ruling out Trinity on this. <laughs> Who will go for us? I'm not ruling it out. I just want to open up a little bit more, broaden our understanding, uh, because the Trinity always existed, right? Um, and we get it fleshed out a little bit more over time throughout Scripture. Um, and so I'm not ruling it out. But I do want to say, like, there's a lot more happening here than just the, well, that's the Trinity. Of course it's the Trinity. Yes, and. Yes, and. Um, and so... Let's look at what he's commissioned to do. Uh, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Here am I, send me. Also, that message, I've been to so many camps, and winter, our summer camp, there's a rhythm for set camp sessions. Night one, uh, you are, you know, call to salvation. Night two, a, uh, you know, be an evangelist, and, and, like, you need to learn how to share your faith kind of thing. Night, night three, like, hey, if there's any sin in your life, you've got to repent hard now. And night four is, are you going to be a missionary? And, or a pastor. Often, that's how camps kind of work their way throughout the week. And they preach this, and they stop here. At here am I, send me. Have all the kids come up, like, send me, send me, send me. And it's good. They should recognize that they are sent into their, their schools and their communities to share the gospel. But we have a danger here if we just say, you're just going to be sent, and it's going to be awesome. Because that was not Isaiah's experience Verse 9, he said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving, make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull, and, their, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. So basically Isaiah's mission is to go and fail. Like you think you're going to go and you're going to call people to repentance and they're actually going to do it. And the Lord is saying, you're not going to do that. These people have gone so far into their rebellion that you calling them to repent is going to actually make them go, no, 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 I'm not listening. And go farther and farther away from what God actually wants the people, how he wants them to live. So Isaiah, you up for that? Are you up for being called to fail? And, and one of the things that the Lord is, this passage should remind us, is the Lord's metric of success is different than worldly metrics of success. Because what the Lord is actually measuring is faithfulness. Will you be faithful to what the Lord has called you to do? I don't think anybody would say Isaiah was a failure. But if you brought Isaiah to a church growth conference and said, hey, Isaiah, tell us your secrets. And he said, well, let me tell you about this time. I was totally overwhelmed when I saw the, the Lord's clothes and dragons. And then, like, all right, thank you for coming. Isaiah. He's like, I'm not done yet. And he would like keep going. And you'd be like, oh, OK, this is not at all what we thought we were going to get from the prophet. But his message is calling them. Uh, calling out the sins of the people, telling them judgment is coming, but then even still, there is, like, and there's a timeline here, like all the cities lie ruined. He's talking about the cities of Judah and Israel being destroyed and everything that they had worked for. The Lord is saying, I'm going to wipe it all out. But even there, there is a tenth of the remains in the land. There's a tenth that remains in the land. There is a a remnant that the Lord will preserve. It's not going to be easy for that remnant. It's not going to be easy for them uh, after this season of discipline. But he's not done. The holy seed 
remains. And so in the stump, we, the holy seed is the, the people. And as we continue to build this metaphor, we will get to that being Jesus is going to be the one who leads them. There's a messianic imagery that's going to come. But right now we're still looking at the people being God's plan to restore the nation eventually. And so, um, yeah, so this is Isaiah's call and his, his uh, commissioning into a ministry of, uh, of great frustration, uh, but also being faithful to the Lord. All right, chapter 7. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, king Rezin, uh, was king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, and that's Israel, is another, Ephraim is another name for the northern kingdom, uh, has aligned itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as, as, as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shear Jashub, which means, I have it in here done on the footnotes, a remnant will return. So Isaiah's son's name is a remnant will return, um, which is a, you know, a weird name to, for your kid. But um, So go, you and remnant go out and talk to Ahaz at the end of this aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and of the son of Ramalia. Aram, Ephraim, and Ramalia's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabil king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says, it will not take place, it will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. <laughs> Which is like, who does he think he is? Uh, only resin? Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Ramalia's son. Doesn't even give him a name. Just Ramalia's son, that guy. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord, your God, for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Uh, he will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and your people on the house of your father's time, unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. And so this is a big deal. This, this, this chapter. It's significant on a lot of different reasons. Um, but first, the, he goes to, the Lord gives uh, Isaiah the call to go and confront Ahaz. What's happening in this time is Ahaz is seeing the political situation up north as Aram and Ephraim are conspiring against Judah, and they're going to put in a puppet, this, uh, this Tabeel guy, can't, they're going to put, put him in there. To rule and who's to be? Who knows? Just some guy, and and so uh, Ahaz sees this trouble coming, and they're nervous, they're afraid, and so the Lord is sending after this message of saying, like, "Hey, there's going to be great destruction." The Lord sends Isaiah to Ahaz to say, "Trust me. Trust me. They're not going to be a problem." And the way that the Lord talks about them, these smoldering coals, basically. The fire is gone. Fire is like where the power comes from, where the heat comes from. And he's like, they're basically, they're, they're, their fire's out. Why are you afraid? They're conspiring against you because they're trying to like pick on you because you're actually doing well and they're not. And like, we need to take them out. 
But Ahaz has also already made a commitment in his heart to align himself with Assyria. As Ephraim, or Israel and Aram are coming against uh, the, the southern kingdom, Ahaz is sending messages out to Assyria to say, I will be your vassal. I will come under your power and make a covenant with you if you will come and deliver us from them. And so this is a big deal because instead of holding on to the covenant with the Lord, let the Lord be their warrior, they're looking to the horses and chariots of Assyria. And so when we read in the psalm, some trust in uh, horses, some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. The, the, that's the kind of situation that we should be thinking about. This is a confrontation um, between earthly power and heavenly power. And so, uh, but he, yeah, so the Lord is saying all of the, their, their power is nothing. They're not going to do anything to you. Will you just trust me? In 65 years, they're, they're not gonna, you're not going to worry about them at all, which is true. As you do the math from, from Ahaz's reign, like the northern kingdom, has, it, the countdown is on. They will not be there for very long. And so Isaiah says, ask the Lord for a sign. Any sign from the highest heavens to the lowest of the earth. So it's like, yeah, ask for for the moon to turn pink, right? Like ask for a volcano to just erupt right now. The Lord is saying, I will do whatever it takes to show you my, my power here. And Ahaz wants to sound super spiritual. It's like, I've, I've, been to, I've been to Sabbath school enough. I know I'm not supposed to put the Lord to the test. And so the difference here between putting the Lord to the test and responding to the Lord's invitation, there's a huge difference. The Lord is saying, I want to give you a sign. And, and what Ahaz is trying to say is like, well, I would never ask for a sign. And the Lord is inviting it. And so he says, no, I could never. And this is where we get such a beautiful promise. And so verse 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel. And this is on every Christmas card (laughs) forever. And so this is where people kind of wrestle with this chapter uh, in particular is what would this mean for Ahaz and what does this mean for us? And so people, um, you know, if we have a, a, a just Christian reading, looking back, we're like, well, this is Jesus. But that means nothing to Ahaz. That, would, that was hundreds of years after Ahaz was long dead. So why would that be assigned to Ahaz? And so we have to think through, like, okay, so what is, what is the Lord saying to him right now? So I'm not done with Jesus. I'll get back to Jesus, all right? Um, so the word for virgin, alma, can also be translated as maiden. So a, a young woman of marriageable age. And so it's a, in, in that time, it was assumed that that person, that young woman of marriageable age would be a virgin. And so that's one of the reasons why it's been translated uh, virgin from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uh, and then even now in our English translations, we lean into translating that virgin. Totally makes sense. So, who is that virgin? Is it the king, uh, a wife of the king? People have said maybe that's it. It could be the wife of Isaiah, but we already know that Isaiah's wife has kids, so she's not a virgin. Um, and so, um, or it could just be a woman who is, not, who is a virgin now and is not yet pregnant. All right? So, if a woman who is a virgin now and not yet pregnant is going to conceive, that's at least nine months. Okay? So, we're just doing math now. All right? So, from here to nine months, uh, okay, baby's born. So, then the baby has to be weaned and be able to eat uh, curds and, and honey. Um, which is probably like around two years, 
right? And curds and honey is not like a, a great blessing. Um, it's actually a sign like the only food that's going to be left is what bees can make and what cows can produce is essentially like, it's not like, it's not ice cream at this point. The baby's not eating ice cream. All right. So you give this baby about two years from right now. In that two year span, the problems that you're having with Ephraim and Aram will be no more. That's the sign to Ahaz. So basically the Lord is saying like, put it on a clock. In this period of time, you will not have to worry about those two kingdoms coming against you anymore. That's the sign. He could have asked for a volcano, right? But instead, the Lord said, I'm going to give you a baby. And you're going to watch this kid grow. And as you see the kid grow, you're going to have to remember to trust me anyway. That's the sign. So when we, Sean can come in. <laughs> I see him over there. Um, so, uh, hey, man. So as we then transfer, like continue on through history, there, there is this messianic expectation in the peop- for the people of Israel. They are waiting for a rescuer, right? And they read through these passages, and one of the understandings uh, is that the Lord is still working. And so for the people of Israel, like they read the prophets and they say, this was a message to Ahaz, but we also are anticipating the Lord is going to do and uh, can continue to do mighty and awesome things. And so then Mary has her encounter with the angel. And the angel says, you are going to conceive and bear a child. And she says, how can this be? For I am a virgin. And so we look to the Gospel of Matthew, where we see this transferred over. The, and Matthew says, this, it, this fulfills Isaiah 7, 14. He doesn't say 7, 14. Those are numbers that we had later. Anyway, um, this fulfills what the prophet said. The virgin will conceive and bear a child. And so there is the fulfillment in the time of Ahaz, but then there is a greater fulfillment that Matthew is referring to, saying like what God did here was amazing and, and a sign for Ahaz, but look at what God is doing now and this sign of the virgin conceiving and bearing a child. This is a sign not just for Israel, but for the world. And, it, and this, is the, this is the Messiah that we have been longing for. Four. All right, so Isaiah 7, 14, wonderful, powerful message to the people of Israel or to the people of Judah at the time. And for Christians, we can read back in here and say, look at what God continued to do. Look at how he ultimately fulfilled this in this miraculous conception and birth of, uh, of our Messiah, Jesus. All right, so, um, yeah, so, when we read through the prophets, and like not every prophecy is going to point to Jesus, but there are times where we can see, oh, this, this was fulfilled in here, but then we'll read the New Testament and they'll be like, look at this. This echoes this. And so sometimes you, the, the, there's the expression like history repeats itself. And so when we read through the prophets and the New Testament, one of the things we should think through is not that history repeats itself, but it seems to rhyme. And, and so this is like a rhyme, a, an echo of what happened. And the Lord is saying, look, there's even more that I'm doing uh, than what I did then. Like it's even greater and more powerful. So, um, all right. So, um, yeah. So even here, like he says, like uh, he will be eating curds and honey. And so that's essentially saying like the land is going to be desolate. Like <laughs> the Lord's saying like, I will preserve you. Things are going to still be rough. Things are still going to be hard. And you're not going to, it's not baby eating ice cream. Like all that's going to, like all of your produce, all of your, all of the things that you planted and, and were hoping to live off of, that's all going to be destroyed because Assyria is going to eat all that up when they do come. But you will be preserved. Like I will protect you from the immediate threat of Israel and Arab. So let's, uh, let's keep going. Verse 18. Uh, uh, yeah, verse 18. This is some more great imagery. In that day, the Lord will whistle for flies from the Nile Delta in Egypt and for bees from the land of Assyria. 
They will all come and settle in the steep ravines, in the crevices, in the rocks, on the thorn bushes, at all the water holes. In that day, the Lord will use a razor hired from beyond the Euphrates River, the king of Assyria, to shave your head and your private parts and to cut off your beard also. In that day, a person will keep alive a young cow and two goats, and because of the abundance of the milk they give, there will be curds to eat. All who remain in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, in every place where there were a thousand vines worth a thousand silver shekels, there will only be briars and thorns. Hunters will go there with bow and arrow, for the land will be covered with briars and thorns. As for all the hills once cultivated by the hoe, you will, be, you will no longer go there for fear of the briars and thorns. They will become places where cattle are turned loose and where sheep run. So we get this image, this, this, this promise, I will preserve you, trust me, but then also Assyria is still going to come. Egypt is still coming. And so like, just because I'm preserving you doesn't mean there, isn't, there aren't consequences for your rebellion, people of Israel and Judah. There are consequences that they have to deal with. And so, yeah, I mean, it, we have to be careful just to not take the verse we like and put that on the, on the Christmas card. We have to look at the whole thing. Like, this, this, is, this is heavy stuff that the people had to hear and, and wrestle with. And the question before them is, will you trust the Lord in hardship? Will you trust the Lord for the remnant of the people, who, the tenth who will remain? Will you trust the Lord even though all the work that you went into putting, like planting vineyards and gardens and all that stuff is all going to be overrun with thorn bushes? Uh, will you still trust the Lord for that, that season? And that's where we'll stop. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I mean, next we get another picture in chapter 8. The Lord is calling, uh, calls Isaiah uh, to name his children like, uh, with names that are pointing to his plans for the people of Israel. Um, and we start to continue to build the hope for the, the nation um, while also looking at the fact that, yeah, God's using Assyria now but he also will judge Assyria for their own rebellion, for their own sinfulness. And so even though like he whistles and Egypt and Assyria respond like trained dogs, like that's the imagery, like or bees and flies, right? Like they're his, they're his tools to use as he sees fit. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting few chapters here. And there's a lot that uh, I didn't say. But, um, yeah. So, any, any questions on these three chapters? And we don't have our online folks to ask questions uh, tonight, but, yeah. Yes, Renee. So, going back to uh, chapter 5, the song of the vineyard, mm -hmm. I know that we don't necessarily know the context and everything, but just in general, uh, is this just a poem to chant is an actual song do we know by tradition or anything and if and in what context would isaiah present this yeah so the song of the vineyard um is it an actual song how would he present it right i'm repeating that in case you, mm -hmm. the microphone didn't pick you up um so uh this is an actual song it is presented to us as poetry it has meter it has like all of the things that you would look for in poetry hebrew poetry is different than english poetry it's not as concerned with like rhyming as much as like uh, alliteration um, often. And I am not a Hebrew scholar, so just so you know, I'm just remembering from that one year of Hebrew I took. Um, and so the so it is a, a song. And so one of the reasons why the messages were presented as poetry and songs is because they were easy to remember. Like so, he could po possibly have presented this multiple times. You know, and gone to the king and, and sang this in the palace or stood outside the temple and sang this outside the temple. And so people would know, like, this is uh, the prophet. This is his message. Um, you know, so like even now, like when people do like protests, and I'm not like a, I'm not just going to like, not every protest is the thing that we need to be focused on. But 
they don't just sit around and give you position papers, right? Like here are the things that we uh, believe. What do they do? They chant, mm -hmm. you know? And like, I remember watching a lot of, um, uh, in history, we watched a lot of stuff during uh, the 60s and uh, Vietnam. Uh, my history teacher was very much into that period. And so, but like the chant that stuck with me was, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Right? I haven't really taken that class since eighth grade, but that is locked in to my brain, right? And those, those kinds of chants, um, like they get into your heart and your mind. And you really do like, oh, oof, that's intense. That's right in my face. Um, and so like these kinds of messages presented as a song uh, would have been more memorable. So where he presented it, not entirely sure, uh, but it could have been over and over again. So, yeah, but good question. Yeah, so when we see, like, if you are following, like, the NIV, I know um, different translations present things differently, but the NIV will actually block out what looks like a poem, um, and that's telling us this is presented as poetry in the, the Hebrew text. And then the prose is in the, in the paragraphs, right, the normal paragraphs, and it's presented as a normal paragraph in the Hebrew text. And Isaiah is one of those, one of those texts that we actually have a, a strong tradition for a lot of the um, consistency over long periods of time with Isaiah. And so we have this thing called the Masoretic text, which is what the Hebrew scriptures are translated from. Um, and that is the, the scribes that were preserving the text over time. But it was the Masoretic text, I think, if I remember right, I think was in the like 400s is where we have a, the oldest Masoretic text. But then when they dug in and found the Qumran caves and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Isaiah has a massive scroll that is really, really close to the Masoretic text. And so like we, we are in a, uh, we have great confidence with many things in Isaiah. There are still some things where like that word Alma, like the, the, the maiden or the virgin, there's questions around translation um, around ver words like that. But um, yeah, Isaiah is, is very consistent. And it was, there were many copies in the Dead Sea Scrolls of Isaiah. It was very important to the, the Qumran community uh, as they were basically like, uh, they, were, they were like modern day preppers who wanted to live off the grid, uh, <laughs> just expecting the end times. Um, so they were, yeah, they were like that, um, which is a great disrespect, I'm sorry, to the people of Qumran, but uh, what are they gonna do? Uh, anyway, <laughs> so um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, Kevin. At the end of five, Larry, from, from 26 on, is that, did you say that's Assyria coming down to the northern kingdom? And is that what that was? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so he lifts up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles. Yeah, so those are, um, yeah, that would be Assyria coming. Yeah, so basically the Lord is like waving a banner saying, hey, I'm ready for you to come and, and get these people. Okay. Um, yeah. Again, the imagery of like, I whistle, they respond. Yeah. So, yeah. Whereas the Assyrian kings are like, who does God think he is? <laughs> and and the, the Lord is in heaven just laughing. He's like, I know exactly who I am, Joker. Um, so, yeah, exactly right. Like, I am using you for my purposes. So, yeah. Any other questions? Sean, you seem, you're right there? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it fell out of my pocket. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, then we can stop here, and uh, we will uh, be back next week and probably get through Chapter 10, kind of what I'm looking for. Um, I hope Chris is able to get back for Chapter 11 because it's right. This is where we start getting into Jesus more and more Messiah focus um, for the future. So I hope, I hope she'll be able to make it for that one. So, um all right, yeah, so we'll uh, see you all uh, next week. <laughs>